Hebrews in chapter 7. Hebrews in chapter 7. I'm going to be real honest with you here this morning. I had contemplated perhaps just kind of summarizing the last section here. We're looking at verses 1 through 10. We've already taken two messages to cover verses 1, 2, and 3. And now a third message in verses 4 through 10. And we're still not done with Melchizedek. He really continues on in the rest of the chapter. And I'm thinking, I don't want to burn you guys out of Melchizedek. And, uh, but then I got to, to looking at things and I thought, you know, this is God's word. I don't want to go through it quickly. I don't want to skim over it. Um, I'm going to just ask you to be students today and uh, devour the word of God with me and see what it has to say to us here as we look at this type of Christ in the person of Melchizedek, king of Salem and king of, king of peace, king of righteousness. And uh, we're, we're we're definitely trying to take bite-sized chunks so that it's not overwhelming, but then it draws it out longer. But I uh, just ask you to, to bear with me. And not that it's, I, I hope you find it interesting. I hope you find it encouraging. I hope you find it um, a blessing to consider our great high priest, the Lord Jesus, who this is really ultimately about. We know that the theme of Hebrews is the superiority of Christ. And he certainly is a superior high priest. And that's what's being demonstrated here through this type of, of Christ, this Melchizedek, all right? So um, we'll, we'll uh, review briefly here again this morning. I will keep this brief because we've already reviewed last week, and um, I don't want to spend too much time on the review. But we're certainly getting acquainted with Melchizedek here. He is, this, he is um, a superior priest, and that is presented to us here in verses 1, 2, and 3. We... Considered what Melchizedek's priesthood was, was superior to, and of course that's the Levitical priesthood, that's what these Jewish people, the, the writer is writing to here, were. They were Jews, Hebrew people, who were very familiar with the Levitical system. So that's what uh, the writer is comparing to Melchizedek's priesthood, to this priesthood, the, of the Levitical priesthood. And he's also demonstrating how Melchizedek's priesthood is superior and there, was, there were several ways here. It was a royal priesthood. He was a king and priest, as was Christ. It was a universal priesthood. He's a priest not just of Jews, but of also Gentiles, as is Christ. It was a righteous and peaceful priesthood. Righteousness and peace go together, and ultimately only in the person of Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can make anyone righteous. He's the only one that can make anyone peaceful, and at peace with him. And so what a picture of Christ. Then also Melchizedek, was, his was a personal priesthood. It wasn't based on his genealogy, on his pedigree, but on who he was as a person, and such is the case with Christ as well. It was an eternal priesthood. We do believe that Melchizedek was a real person who really did live and die, and yet that's not recorded in Scripture. And the reason it's not recorded, we believe, is so that he could be this type of Christ. Because Christ is eternal. He had no... He's, he's, his, as, a, as a man, he, he, he uh, came to earth at one point in time, but he eternally existed in his spirit and his being, and so uh, and he certainly lives forever now in eternity, sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he is making intercession for us as our great high priest, and so his is an eternal priesthood. It never ends. All right, and that brings us to verses 4 through 10, where we see Melchizedek's superior priesthood proven. Now, I'll just tell you right now, it's already been proven to some degree in the verse three verses. But that's just going to be expanded upon here as we continue on in verses four through 10. Um, the evidence that the writer gives us in verses four through 10 are simply an expansion, a further explanation of what he's already said in verses one, two, and three. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we will begin looking here at verse 4. Father, thank you again for today. It's a blessed day. We've already been blessed, and um, we are so grateful to be able to worship here together today. Lord, we are grateful for the Lord Jesus. He's at the center of our lives, or He needs to be. As believers, there's a, he, he, he really is. And yet there are times when we allow other things to take our focus. In, in practical terms, other things can become 
the center of our lives. And that should never be. And I pray that we would absolutely see the essential truth here that Christ is supreme. He is our great high priest. He is our all in all. He's everything to us and he must remain at the center. And our lives must be built around him. And I, I just pray that we'll have a, a, an extra measure, I don't know if I should say extra measure, but a special sense of worship of you and of the Lord Jesus around his priesthood this morning and that would carry on into our lives. I just ask your blessing on this time together that it will be what you want it to be for us and that it might bring honor and glory to your name. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. You see what it says here in verse 4. It says, Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Now consider. The word consider here is a word that means to discern. The writer is wanting these Hebrew people to discern, to think this through, to really be able to discern how great this man was. And it's, he's, he's at this point talking about Melchizedek, who even... The patriarch, Abraham. Now this is a person who was highly revered in the minds of these Hebrew people. This father, Abraham, even he gave a tenth of the spoils to Melchizedek. So that's our point number one here. This is uh, how this is proven to us that Melchizedek was superior, superior even to Abraham, because Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. Now there's no indication, you remember the background here, remember what Abraham had done, he went and rescued Lot and those citizens of Sodom, Gomorrah and some, other, some others um, against, they'd been, they'd been taken captive, they'd been taken by Cheddar Laomor and his allies and Abraham had gone and rescued them. And there's no indication that Melchizedek had a part in the fight against Chedorlaomer. There's no record of Abraham having had a prior meeting with Melchizedek. There's no record of Melchizedek performing any priestly service for Abraham prior to this. And yet, for whatever reason, we just have to assume God's direct revelation here for Melchizedek and perhaps for Abraham. I don't know, but there's... Apparently, for whatever reason, by whatever means, Abraham simply recognized Melchizedek as a legitimate and faithful high priest to the Most High God. How that happened, I don't know, but it doesn't matter, really. Ultimately, he just understood that. Melchizedek, uh, Abraham understood that Melchizedek was someone to give tithes to. So thus he gave him a tenth of the spoils of this mini-war, Perhaps the choicest of the spoils. In fact, it no doubt was the choicest of the spoils. The first fruit, so to speak. That was the principle here behind Todd. Now remember, these were not the spoils that Abraham had rescued from Chedorlaomer, those things that belonged to the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah and so forth. Those Abraham gave right back to who it belonged to. Because he didn't want anyone to say that they'd made Abraham rich. So these are the spoils from Cheddar Laramore and his, his spoils. Okay, so this is what he gave voluntarily as an expression of thanks to God, to Melchizedek. And now he explains then, the writer of Hebrews explains the significance of this act. The fact that Abraham paid Ties to Melchizedek shows that Melchizedek is superior. Let's read on here in verse 5. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises." Now, beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. 
Here, mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. And we've read the whole section there, and we'll get back to some, uh, uh, we have two more points that will come from there, but the fact that Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek shows that Melchizedek is superior. I'm going to back up here, and as, as the writer does here in verse 5, and he points out that the Levites, being, excuse me, the Levites, pre, being priests, did not receive an inheritance of land. Now, that, he didn't point that out here, but I'm pointing that out. <laughs> remember, because remember the system. The tribes of Israel received an allotment of land, except for the tribe of Levi. So how are they going to provide for themselves? How are they going to, what is going to sustain them? Well, what sustained them was tithes from the other tribes. They were given cities, the Levites were, and were supported by the tithes from their fellow Israelites. That's what verse 5 tells us. They received the priesthood. They have commandments to receive tithes from the people according to the law. That is from their brethren. Okay. So there's a, there's a kind of progression that the writer of Hebrews is pointing out here from the lesser to the greater. The Levites' brothers were subordinate, in a sense, to, um, to, to them since the Levites could require tithes of them. The Levites were subordinate to the priests. The priests were subordinate to Abraham and their common, uh, uh, who of course was their common and supreme ancestor. So Abraham is shown to be the subordinate to Melchizedek here because he paid tithes to him. But then he backs up and says additionally that the Levites who received tithes also paid tithes in advance, so to speak, in Abraham. Did you see what it says there? Um, in verse 9, even Levi who received tithes paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. So what is the writer saying? Melchizedek here in this scenario is really supreme because Abraham paid tithes to him. And, and even all the Levites paid tithes to him, really, in a sense, because they were in the loins of Abraham, and Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Okay. A little foreign to our kind of thinking. Do you follow what he's saying here, right? So the facts here obviously elevate Melchizedek above Abraham and above the Levitical priesthood. Melchizedek's priesthood is superior, and it's proven by the fact that Melchizedek received tithes from Abraham, and by Abraham through all of Israel. So Melchizedek is supreme here. And yet, remember what the Hebrew writer of Hebrews is doing. He is using Melchizedek. He is pointing out that Melchizedek is a type. Well, certainly the type is not as great as the real thing that is pictured. And what is pictured? It is Jesus Christ. So the ultimate supreme one is Jesus here. But there's additional evidence pointing toward Melchizedek's superiority. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Abraham tithe, paid tithes to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Notice verse 1 again. We back up a little bit. He introduces Melchizedek here. He says he's king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And then, of course, we see that again here in our current passage here. Verse 6, But he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. So just as we're not sure how Abraham knew that he should give the first fruits of the spoils to Melchizedek, neither are we sure how Melchizedek knew that he should bless Abraham. Again, it doesn't matter, and it certainly perfectly uh, would stand a reason that somehow the Lord just told him to do so. Now, we know from Scripture, and of course Abraham knew from God, 
that through Abraham and his descendants, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And we know that ultimately that was pointing to Jesus Christ. And this was the promise given to Abraham in his old age, before he had any, he hadn't, wasn't, hadn't been able to have any children. And so it required this miraculous birth of his son Isaac. You know the story. And then, of course, through Abraham, he would have a, a nation, a seed, a blessing, a land, all the promises that God had given to him. Somehow Melchizedek knew. Now think about the, prom, uh, the prominence now of, of Abraham. Remember, we already alluded to this at the beginning. Even Abraham, he says here, because he, he's revered amongst the Israelites. And think about how much of Scripture is dedicated to, or maybe I shouldn't say dedicated, but certainly is about Abraham and his descendants. How much of it is about the Jews? We can make a really, really strong argument that the Word of God, the Bible, is primarily a Jewish book. If you take your Bible and you would go to Genesis chapter 12, because that's about where we start seeing about Abram, who was later turned, changed, name changed to Abraham, and then if you actually legitimately, I think, go through the Gospels, because the Gospels are still really primarily Old Testament until Jesus dies and ratifies a new covenant, right, through his blood. Well, that's how much of my Bible <laughs> is really a Jewish book, right? I'm not suggesting it's not profitable for all of us. All Scripture is profitable, Right? But Abraham and his descendants permeate the Word of God. Abraham was a great man. <clears throat> now Melchizedek, interestingly, is barely mentioned. Three times he shows up in Scripture, and yet the Scriptures here demonstrate that he is superior to Abraham. He is a priest-king. And even though he's only mentioned a handful of times in the entire Bible, he was greater than Abraham. God used him, Melchizedek, on the basis of his personal qualifications. And he was higher than even Abraham in those qualifications. So he was chosen to bless Abraham. And verse 7 makes it clear. Beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. It's not pulling any, it's not, it's not stuttering here, it's clear. Melchizedek is the better because he blessed Abraham. There's a third piece of evidence. Melchizedek's priesthood is eternal. We've already seen that. Again, like I said, this is just expounding upon what we've already seen. It's first mentioned at the end of verse 3. Um, that he was made like the Son of God. That's Melchizedek, neither beginning of days nor end of life, but he remains a priest continually. And again, there we believe it's talking about his order. This is a different order than the Levitical order. So Melchizedek's priesthood is, is eternal. There, Pointed out again in verse 8, here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witnessed that he lives. So even if the Levites were not required to end their service as priests at the age of 50, they would have to end their priesthood the day their hearts stopped beating. They're mortal men. They're going to die. And they did die. So their priesthood was temporary, if nothing else, because of death. Melchizedek, it is witness that he liveth. He lives. This is who Abraham paid tithes to. As we've mentioned, his death is not recorded in Scripture, so that his priesthood typically is eternal, making his priesthood superior to Aaron's. Now again, make, let's never lose sight of this. Christ is the reality. He's the one pictured 
He is the only priest who is eternal. He is a living priest, not a dying one. He's the only priest of the only priesthood that can bring God to men and bring men to God. What words of assurance these must have been to those Jews who had put their faith in Christ. Remember the situation. Remember the persecution they were under. Remember the temptation, the pressure they were receiving to return back to Judaism. And what an encouragement this must have been to those who were not believers in Christ who perhaps were being drawn to Jesus. But you may ask the question, but what, but what application is there for us? After all, we live in a time and in a dispensation far removed from the time of these Hebrew people. They were struggling with the transition from the old covenant to the new covenant. They were being asked to leave a God-ordained tradition. God-ordained commands that have been a part of their Jewish heritage for centuries. They're being asked to leave that and to turn and make Christ the center of their lives. Ours isn't a struggle of leaving one God-ordained structure and order to enter into a whole new one. Yet there may be more similarities than we may at first acknowledge. What's at the core? What's at the root? What's at the heart of the matter here for these Jewish people? That's what God always is most concerned about. It's not that outward behavior and, and so forth doesn't matter. Obviously, God set that old covenant up with a whole lot of <clears throat> behavior, <clears throat> very meticulous rules and regulations and ceremonies and feasts and sacrifices and so forth that had to be observed. And it was, again, it was God-ordained. It was something He established. It was good. It had its purpose. We know that it fulfilled its purpose well. It demonstrated to people that the law can't be kept, that we don't have it within ourselves to do so. The law was a schoolmaster to point us to Jesus Christ. So what is at the root of this? You know, even in the first century, we had people who became libertines, people who turned the grace of God into license. We also had people who were Judaizers, people who still exalted the law, people who suggest, suggested that if you were going to be a Christian, you had to first become a Jew. So, <clears throat> none of that is new. That started early on. And both of those things reflect a lack of self-denial, a lack of self-sacrifice, a lack of, of dying to self. It, it, they, they demonstrate this this fleshly desire we have to be what we want to be and to be in control. Libertines, people setting aside the list, <laughs> turning the grace of God into lasciviousness or license, it's not new. And they were doing it in the first century because it's, it's wonderful just there's this fleshly desire to say, hey, the grace of God gives me the, the freedom to live as I want. But God's grace is not an entitlement for me to live as I want. It is enablement for me to live as God wants. You've heard me say it many times that there's this tendency for us to go up to one, one or two extremes. Either we want to exalt a list. That's what Judaizers did. And that's what many Christians who, who were being influenced by Judaizers did. And they wanted to cling still to the law. And it was a, a fleshly way to be in control of my spirituality. If I can just keep this list, I can be spiritual. And almost everybody who keeps a list looks to that list for their spirituality, while in many, many, many areas of life they're not spiritual at all. And in fact, even if it's just the list, they're not spiritual. What is a spiritual life? Is it not a life enabled and directed by the Spirit of God? That's what a spiritual life is. 
And if a person in their own fleshly ability is keeping some list, that's the flesh. There's nothing spiritual about that. So it's either keeping the list or throwing out the list. And that's not new. That was happening in the first century. And many in this context were wanting to hold on to the list. They didn't want to transition away from the law to Christ. And we know that Christ just elevates us way beyond the law. Not in some sort of a, some sort of a oppressive sort of way, but because we love him because he is everything to us, because he has purchased us, because we're not our own. We've been bought by the price. It was his blood. And out of love for him, we are motivated to reflect who he is in his holy character. That's what motivates us. That's never been the easy route. It just isn't. It's much easier to throw off the list or to cling to the list. That's fleshly. You know what? We as believers, we've been called to self-denial. And in reality, it's a freeing thing. that Our minds don't want to work that way, right? We think that if we have to deny self, I have to give something up that I want. I have to, it's oppressive, it's it's hard, it's difficult. Well, yeah, okay, there, there is a battle, no question. It's hard. The flesh doesn't want to give up. But it's to our benefit, it's to our blessing when we deny ourselves. And we're called that over and over again in Scripture. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says... If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature, a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 to 24, tell tell us that we're supposed to put off the old man. We're supposed to put off that flesh. We can because of Christ. We're to put off concerning our former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And we're to be renewed in in the spirit of our minds. To put on a new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. It's a continual battle. That's why in Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2, Paul begs the Romans and by us, and, and by extension us as well, I beseech you, I beg you, I plead with you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. This is how you do it. It's, it's in light of the mercies of God and through his enablement that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The new life that Christ calls us to is centered around him. That was really hard for these Jews. Many of them just didn't even believe Christ was who he said he was. He didn't fit their preconceived notion of what their Messiah would be like. Others who did recognize the Messiah and acknowledged him as theirs and put their faith and trust in him still had this fleshly tendency and temptation to go back to that which they could control. When it boils right down to it, it isn't all the same for us. We, we acknowledge Christ. We certainly acknowledge who he is. In fact, we can list off a whole lot of facts about the Lord Jesus Christ. We recognize his humility and his miraculous virgin birth. We recognize his deity. We recognize his substitutionary death and his resurrection, his ascension and exaltation his priesthood, his intercessory ministry, his lordship. We can list it all. We can can rattle it off. And yet acknowledging facts is not the same as embracing those facts and living our lives in complete accord with them. See, we're not guilty of failure to receive the truth about who Christ is. We are guilty of taking him for granted. And what's the end product of that? And this is never all or nothing. Please understand that as I present these things to you. I'm just saying these are things that are our tendency. We have to stay on top of these things by God's grace and just allow His Spirit to keep working in our hearts to keep Christ central. 
Not just as some sort of figurehead, but in reality. It's so easy to take him lightly, to take him for granted. To lose sight of the impact of what he is as our great high priest. That's why, frankly, I have this fear that these messages about Melchizedek are somehow going to be academic and boring because we have lost sight of who Christ is. We've taken him for granted. We've lost sight of the incredible impact that Christ makes in our lives. We take him lightly. Taking him lightly means we fail to appreciate him like we ought. We fail to worship him like we ought. And when we fail to worship him, we will not live for him like we ought because you're not going to live for someone you don't worship. That's why it's so easy to live for self because let's face it, folks, we worship ourselves. I mean, that's just what comes naturally for us. We think we are worth an awful lot. And then we really, really, really want to follow what we want. And what our desires are, rather than deny ourselves and follow Christ. That's what discipleship is. Taking up our cross daily. Why daily? Because it is a constant battle to follow him. So failure to live for him means we're living for something, and if it's not him, it's us. There's only two choices on the shelf, pleasing God or pleasing self. So when it comes down to it, we're really not a whole lot different than these Hebrews. Tempted to gravitate towards something that's not self-denial. <laughs> Where I'm contributing something or I am being, making sure that I'm pleased by something. <laughs> Whatever pleases me. We have a great high priest in Jesus that means everything to us, whether we sometimes recognize that or not. He has saved us. He saves us. That's why I picked that song. He saves and keeps and sanctifies. He's our eternal high priest. He's our all in all. Let us stand fast in the confidence, in the peace, in the hope that we have in Christ our High Priest. The order of priests made up of Levites has ended. We know that. The priesthood after the order of Melchizedek has resumed with the priesthood of Jesus Christ. He's the eternal great high priest, the author of eternal salvation. And the same God who saved us is the same, same Christ who saved us is the same Christ who sanctifies us. And we can draw near to him, near to the heart of God. It's an appropriate prelude for us this morning. And then we sang the song again today, Draw Near. Let's, let's, let's never be guilty of taking Christ, our high priest, for granted. Let's never lose sight of all that we have in him. Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for this passage of Scripture. Easy for us to look at it as inconsequential for us. Easy for us to look at it as just something for these Hebrew people that they needed to know, but not so much for us. And yet right down in our heart of hearts, I feel that we are the same human nature is there for us today as there was in the time of the writing of this book. A tendency toward self being at the center. Not truly dying to self and embracing the person of Jesus Christ. And we know from your word over and over that even as believers, it's a daily task for us to die to self, to mortify the flesh, to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the deeds of the flesh. We're to be living sacrifices that stay on the altar. So Lord, 
thank you for Jesus. I, I, again, I pray that in, not just in lips, not just in words, but in our hearts, we will truly have Christ at the center. Exalt him to his position. And just live our lives in him and he in us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.